Vanka by Anton Chekhov. Nine-year-old Vanka Zukov, who had been apprenticed to the shoemaker Alekin for three months, did not go to bed the night before Christmas. He waited till the master and mistress and the assistants had gone out to an early church service to procure from his employer's cupboard a small vial of ink and a penholder with a rusty nib. Then, spreading a crumpled sheet of paper in front of him, he began to write. Before, however, deciding to make the first letter, he looked furtively at the door and at the window, glanced several times at the somber icon, on either side of which stretched shelves full of lasts, and heaved a heart-rending sigh. The sheet of paper was spread on a bench, and he himself was on his knees in front of it. Dear Grandfather Konstantin Makarich, he wrote, I am writing you a letter. I wish you a happy Christmas and all God's holy best. I have no mama or papa. You are all I have. Vanka gave a look towards the window in which shone the reflection of his candle and vividly pictured to himself his grandfather, Konstantin Makarich, who was a night watchman at Messrs. Ziverev. He was small and lean and unusually lively, an active old man of 65, always smiling and bleary-eyed. All day he slept in the servant's kitchen or trifled with the cooks. At night, enveloped in an ample sheepskin coat, he strayed around the domain tapping with his cudgel. Behind him, each hanging its head, walked the old dog Kashtanka and the dog Vion, so named because of his black coat and long body and resemblance to a loach. Vion was an unusually civil and friendly dog, looking as kindly at a stranger as his masters, but he was not to be trusted. Beneath his deference and his humbleness was hidden the most inquisitorial maliciousness. No one knew better than he how to sneak up and take a bite at a leg, or slip into the larder and steal a mosaic's chicken. More than once they had nearly broken his hind legs. Twice he'd been hung up. Every week he was nearly flogged to death, but he always recovered. At this moment, for certain, Vanka's grandfather must be standing at the gate, blinking his eyes at the bright red windows of the village church, stamping his feet in their high felt boots, and jesting with the people in the yard. His cudgel will be hanging from his belt. He will be hugging himself with the cold, giving a little dry old man's cough, and at times, pinching a servant girl or a cook. Won't we take some snuff, he asks, holding out his snuff box to the women. The women take a pinch of snuff and sneeze. The old man goes into indescribable ecstasies, breaks into loud laughter, and cries, Oh, off with it. It will freeze to your nose. He gives his snuff to the dogs, too. Kashtanka sneezes, twitches her nose, and walks away offended. Vian deferentially refuses to sniff and wags his tail. It is glorious weather, not a breath of wind, clear and frosty. It is a dark night, but the whole village, its white roofs and streaks of smoke from the chimneys, the trees silvered with hoarfrost and the snowdrifts, well, you can see it all. The sky scintillates with bright, twinkling stars, and the Milky Way stands out so clearly that it looks as if it polished and rubbed over with snow for the holidays. Vanka sighs, dips his pen in the ink, and continues to write. Well, last night I got a thrashing. My master dragged me by my hair into the yard and belabored me with a shoemaker's stirrup, because, while I was rocking his brat in its cradle, I unfortunately fell asleep. And during the week my mistress told me to clean a herring, and I began by its tail, so she took the herring and stuck its snout into my face. The assistants tease me, send me to the tavern for vodka, make me steal the master's cucumbers, and the master beats me with whatever is handy. Food there is none. In the morning it's bread, and at dinner, gruel. In the evening, it's bread again. As for tea or sour cabbage soup, the master and the mistress themselves guzzle at. They make me sleep in the vestibule, and when the brat cries, I don't sleep at all, but I have to rock the cradle. Dear Grandpapa, for heaven's sake, take me away from here, home to our village. I can't bear this any more. I bow to the ground to you, and will pray to God forever and ever. Take me from here, or I shall die. The corner of Anka's mouth went down, and he rubbed his eyes with his dirty fist and sobbed. I'll grate your tobacco for you, he continued. I'll pray to God for you, and if there's anything wrong, 
Then flog me like the gray goat. And if you really think I shan't find work, then I'll ask the manager, for Christ's sake, to let me clean boots, or I'll go instead to Fedja as an underherdsman. Dear Grandpapa, I can't bear this any more. It'll kill me. I wanted to run away to our village, but I have no boots, and I was afraid of the frost. And when I grow up, I'll look after you. No one shall harm you. And when you die, I'll pray for the repose of your soul, just like I do for Mama Pelegua. And as for Moscow, well, it is a large town. There are all gentlemen's houses, lots of horses, no sheep, and the dogs are not vicious. The children don't come round at Christmas with a star. No one is allowed to sing in the choir. And once I saw in a shop window hooks on a line and fishing rods, all for sale and for every kind of fish. Awfully convenient. And there was one hook which would catch a sheet fish weighing a pound. And there are shops with guns like the master's, and I'm sure they must cost a hundred rubles each. And in the meat shops, there are woodcocks, partridges, and hares, but who shot them or where they come from, the shopman won't say. Dear Grandpapa, when the masters give a Christmas tree, take a golden walnut and hide it in my green box. Ask the young lady, Olga Ignatevna, for it for say it's for Vanka. Vanka sighed convulsively and again stared at the window. He remembered that his grandfather always went to the forest for the Christmas tree and took his grandson with him. What happy times! The forest crackled. His grandfather crackled. And as they both did, Vanka did the same. Then before cutting down the Christmas tree, his grandfather smoked his pipe, took a long pinch of snuff, and made fun of poor, frozen little Vanka. The young fir trees wrapped in hoarfrost stood motionless, waiting for which of them would die. Suddenly a hare springing from somewhere would dart over the snowdrift, and his grandfather could not help shouting, Catch it! Catch it! Catch it! Ah, short-tailed devil! When the tree was down, his grandfather dragged it to the master's house, and there they set about decorating it. The young lady, Olga Ictegnia, Vanka's great friend, busied herself most about it. When little Vanka's mother, Plegvia, was still alive and was a servant woman in the house, Olga Ignatevna used to stuff him with sugar candy, and, having nothing to do, taught him to read, write, and count up to one hundred, and even to dance the quadrille. When Pelagueya died, they placed the orphan Vanka in the kitchen with his grandfather, and from the kitchen he was sent to Moscow to Alakin, the shoemaker. Come quick, dear grandpapa, continued Vanka. I beseech you, for Christ's sake, take me from here. Have pity on a poor orphan, for here they beat me, and I'm frightfully hungry and so sad that I can't tell you that I cry all the time. The other day the master hit me on the head with the last. I fell to the ground and only just returned to life. My life is a misfortune, worse than any dog's. I send greetings to Eliona, to one-eyed Tagor, and the coachman, and don't let anyone have my mouth organ. I remain your grandson, Ivan Zukov, dear grandpapa. Please do come. Vanka folded his sheet of paper in four and put it into an envelope purchased the night before for a kopeck. He thought a little, dipped the pen into the ink, and wrote the address. The village to my grandfather. He then scratched his head, thought again, and added, Konstantin Makarich. Pleased at not having been interfered with in his writing, he put on his cap and, without putting it on his sheepskin coat, ran out in his shirt sleeves to the street. The shopman at the poulterers from whom he'd inquired the night before had told him that letters would be put in the post boxes, and from there they were conveyed over the whole earth in mail troikas by drunken postboys and to the sound of bells. Vanka ran to the first post box, slipped in his precious letter into the slit. An hour afterwards, lulled by hope, he was sleeping soundly. In his dreams, he saw a stove, and by the stove, his grandfather sitting with his legs dangling down, barefooted and reading a letter to the cooks, and Vian walking round the stove, wagging his tail. <laughs>